with you the second speaker of uh, today, this morning session, is uh, Alexander Bonven from the Utrecht University and is having his lectures, lecture on integrative modeling of biomolecular complexes. So, Alexander. Thank you very much for the, for the introduction and the kind invitation to speak here in Lugano. It's, uh, of course, a beautiful place and today is a beautiful day, but we are all stuck here in this lecture hall and you have to listen for me to me for the next one and a half hour. So I'm going to speak about um, integrative modeling of complexes. So the focus will be more on, uh, on larger biomolecular complexes today. Um, and this is, of course, come on. So we are in Switzerland. My home country is Switzerland, so of course I'm glad to be here, but I'm not from the Italian part, I'm from the French part, which is touched over the mountain, not so far away. But currently I'm based in Utrecht, at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. This is the, our academy building uh, in the old center of the city, and this is the building where I'm located. This is actually my office, so if you look very carefully, you should be able to see me work there. And uh, everything that I'm doing is in the context of uh, experiments and experimental groups because my group doing computational structural biology is embedded in an institute where structural biology in general and a lot of structural biology techniques are present. So everything that we have been doing over the years has been in the context of experimental people in the context of using experimental data as much as possible to guide the modeling process, hence this integrative modeling uh, title. So we are actually uh, operating as a European large-scale facility for NMR uh, through different projects, INEX, and there's the INEX Discovery one. So if you are in need of experimental access to NMR, you can come to Utrecht. And a lot of what we are doing on the computational side are also being supporting over the, supported over the year by different European projects that are giving you access to uh, the computational resource that we need to provide the services and the current one are BioExcel, a center of excellence in, for computational biomolecular research, and the European Open Science Cloud Hub project, which is providing us access to high throughput compute resources. So this is the uh, topic for today. So I'm going to give you a general introduction. Of course, by now, after Ruben's lecture yesterday, you're all experts in docking and in small molecule. So I guess I can go quite fast on some aspects. Uh, I want to speak a little bit about information sources that we can use to model complexes when the classical structural methods are failing or when they are too expensive or too time consuming. Uh, this will be very short. <clears throat> then I will tell you how we are approaching the problem, how we are using information to guide the modeling in Haddock, which is the method we have been developing for more than 15 years now. And I will uh, continue with some examples of using information and then depending on time, uh, you might decide what's the next topic that I'm going to speak about. In this multiple choice session, I have about 20 topics that I could speak about, so we will, we're in Switzerland, so in a very democratic way, you're going to vote, and I can speak uh, forever, so we could skip lunch, but I uh, will not do that, don't worry. Okay, so I should not move too far away from the computer, apparently. So everything in life, and everything at a molecular, but everything at a human level is also uh, dictated by interactions between humans, interactions between molecules. This is a view of the center of Utrecht, where there is a beautiful canal running, running through the city, full of terraces, and on those terraces, people are interacting. Now, at the molecular level, at the cellular level, interactions are everywhere as well, and actually the previous talk has also been dealing with this kind of network modeling of interactions. So here we want to dig more at the atomic level into what's happening when molecules talk to each other. So this brings us, so we have the genome, which contains, of course, on genomic information, DNA sequence. You go to the next level of organization, which is the proteome, so all the proteins that are expressed in a cell. And one level above that brings us to the interactome, or these networks that were presented in the previous talk, where each dot here represents a protein, and each connection between those represents an interaction. So if you do statistics on this kind of interactome data, and this can be obtained by high throughput techniques, so these are by no means um, accurate, 
So there's a lot of false positive. So there are data in there that should not be there. There are also data in there that you don't see. So there's a lot of false negative as well. Anyway, if you do some statistics here, you will realize that there are many more lines than there are dots, meaning that each protein or each biomolecule during its lifetime is going to interact with up to 10 other molecules on average. So this can be binary interactions, but this can also be assemblies of multiple molecules that form complex assemblies. This looks like a two-dimensional uh, network, but actually there are many more dimensions to it because the network is not static. The network is going to be rewired depending on where you are in a cell cycle, depending also on where you are inside the cell. So are you in a nucleus or in a cytoplasm? Some interactions will be turned on and off. And another dimension that you have to add will be the post-translational modifications that are well known to modulate interactions as well. So it's a highly complex system. And if you want to understand this network at, at a molecular level, you will need to add the structural dimension to those interactions, meaning modeling or solving the structure by experimental methods of those complexes. So if you want to look at the structural biology of interactions, we can go from the right to the say more experimental approach, to the left to the computational, the modeling approach. So the classical method to look uh, at structures, of course, is X-ray crystallography, NMR, although here you might have a size limit, so you can, for, for complexes, this might be uh, harder. X-ray also limits for complexes, like the, the binding affinity, if it's very weak, it might not crystallize, or you might only crystallize one of the components of the complex. And these days, cryo-electron microscopy, of course, is contributing a lot as well to solve or to, to cover this interactome space. But there are other methods here listed, which will be coming back later, that are providing you pieces of the puzzle. They are not going to provide you the full structure, but they're going to give you useful pieces. As you move to the left, then we, we enter the field of, of modeling. And if you're interested in structure, you can try to generate uh, structures by homology modeling and you had a lecture yesterday about this topic, so you know everything about it. Threading falls also on that, that, that category. You might want to use molecular dynamics, but for today, the focus will be docking. And I don't uh, really need to introduce docking, but why is docking an uh, interesting approach? So these are old statistics taken from the Interactome 3D database uh, from Patrick Alloy in Barcelona, and you can update these, but the, the picture does not change that much. So this is statistics about the structural coverage of interactomes. So let's look, uh, let's look at human. So uh, at that time, there were 45 documented interactions in the database. There are many more interactions, okay? So if we think of the human proteome, how many proteins are encoded in our genome? Average, like so, some number, okay? So how many proteins do we have are encoded in our genome? Sorry? 20,000, yes. So 20, 22,000, whatever the number, it doesn't matter. But I told you we have on average maybe 10 interactions per protein, so this is bringing you to a level of several hundred of thousands of interactions. And those are dynamic, and the assemblies will consist of multiple molecules, so we are dealing with a, a structural interactome of several hundreds of those interactions. So it, it's going to be hard to study them, to characterize all of them experimentally. And this is reflected in what you find in a protein database. So this is a small number, 45,000. This is not hundreds of thousands, but these are only the interaction at the time for which there was experimental proof that this interaction was taking place in a cell. Okay, so these are documented, validated interaction. Now, if you look at those, for less than 5% of those at the time, there was a full structure of the complex available in a PDB. Another 5%, actually this together is less than 10%, uh, you could have a domain-domain interaction model of structure, so you don't have the structure of the full complex, but structure of the parts that are important for the interaction, or you can model the complex by homology modeling techniques. And then you have this big blue region, which is about 50% in this case, where we do have the structure of the interactors, but we don't know how they interact. And that's the good news for methods like docking, because you have the starting point, you have the structure, and then you have to solve a 3D puzzle and put them together. And then you have one third here, which is gray, and this has probably not changed much if you go look at the statistics today. 
uh, where there is nothing. We don't have the structure we don't, of the component, we don't have the structure of the complex. What do you find in there? A lot of membrane, membrane-associated proteins will be in that class. They are difficult to study experimentally. But also a lot of intrinsically disordered proteins, or protein that contain intrinsically disordered regions that, again, are very difficult to study by experimental methods. So docking in a nutshell, and again, I should not need to explain that because it was explained to you yesterday, but given two molecules, can you solve this 3D puzzle, how they interact, in this case, to proteins? Uh, so the field is about, what is it, close to 30 years old. The first docking software for protein-protein docking was uh, developed by Joel Jana and Shoshana Vodak, and this was late 70s, early 80s. And at the time, it was mainly shape complementarity, which was used as a measure of, uh, of the fit between the molecule. And then you can add physics, chemistry to it, electrostatic interactions, Van der Waals interactions, and, and whatever other type of energy function. And the search that you have to do if you assume that the molecules are rigid will be a six-dimensional search problem. You can fix one molecule at the origin of space of your coordinate system. You will have to translate the other molecule in three dimensions and sample all possible translation. And you will have to rotate the other molecule also along three axes. So that's a six-dimensional search. And for each rotation that you sample, you have to sample all translation. Now add to that conformational variability, flexibility, and your, the dimensionality of your search space explodes. So uh, speaking of docking, so we have this kind of conformational landscape, which tells you, OK, this is my interaction landscape. You have some kind of energy that defines the quality of, a, of an interaction, of a model. So the sampling phase is generating models that cover this landscape. And then you have the scoring phase in the docking, which is basically measuring or predicting the quality of those models in order to distinguish or to predict which one is the best. Hopefully, it should be the minimum of the energy function that you define. Now, if you have data, could be experimental data, but also bioinformatic data. You might decide to use the data to either bias the sampling, and you say, I'm not going to, to search the entire space anymore, but I'm going to concentrate my search in some region of space. And or you can use the data also in discriminating good from bad model. So if you use data during sampling, so instead of going for a systematic search of your interaction landscape, you're going to concentrate the search in one region. The good thing here is that you can spend maybe more time in the right region of space to, to fine tune your modeling. The danger is that if you have bad data, you're going to get bad results. That's the GIGO principle. So you can go in with Wikipedia, look up GIGO. It's the garbage in, garbage out principle. Okay, you put wrong data in your modeling software, you're going to get wrong models, but you're always going to get something. And then distinguishing what is wrong and right is not always simple. So it has advantages. You can direct the search to the relevant region of space, but it also has danger. And it depends very much on how much you trust the information that you have at hand to guide your modeling process. So in integrative modeling these days, uh, basically, we are referring to the techniques that are integrating data from different sources. And the sources is something we're going to discuss in the next uh, uh, few minutes uh, to get to the answer, which is, in our case, structure of some large biomolecular assemblies. And typically, when you move to large complex system, there will not be one experimental technique that's going to give you all the answers that you need but you will have to combine different techniques. You have to integrate information from different techniques to guide your modeling process. So if you are an experimentalist, uh, you're going to generate models. And models are good. They are not there just to generate a nice picture in some papers, but the models are there to generate hypotheses. And with hypotheses, you can go back to the experimental to do experiments and validate your models. Uh, this is going to speed up structural determination and you hope that the model allows you to understand better how things work. You might, not have to have, you might not need to have a fully accurate model to start understanding things. You might not need to have a fully accurate model to start making predictions, to generate hypotheses that you can test in the lab. If you are more on the modeling side and you're going to use data, you hope that 
by using data, by integrating data, you're going to decrease your high false positive rate. So we generate a lot of models that are bad and they are not always easy to identify. And of course, having data allows you to assess the accuracy of your modeling. So these are a number of reviews that, that uh, we have been writing over the years on, on the topic of integrative modeling. I'm going to share the slides with you, so no need to take pictures. Uh, if you're interested in general in the field of docking, there is uh, every second year on average a special issue of proteins which is dedicated to CAPRI, and CAPRI stands for Critical Assessment of Predicate Interaction. It's a blind experiment where there is about 40 groups worldwide participating. It's usually protein-protein docking, but we also had recently peptide and oligosaccharides. And you can read in those issues what's the state of the art. And there should be a new issue appearing probably early 2020 about the latest rounds of, uh, of Capri. Okay, so let's move into information sources for the next few minutes. So when you can not study by classical structural method your, your complex, uh, it's not the end of the world because there might be still a lot of information. And it can start simply in a wet lab doing experiments, doing mutated genesis experiments, where if you know the structure of your proteins, you can start mutating amino acid on the surface, and then you need to have some kind of binding assay, which can be a biophysical method, but which could be a biochemical method, like running a gel, could be as simple as that. And you assess if the mutation affects the binding or not. If the complex is still formed, you will uh, interpret this as this is not important for binding. If the complex is no longer formed, this is information telling you that this residue must be somewhere uh, involved in the interaction. It could also be that your protein is not stable anymore and then your protein is not folded. And of course, uh, if it's not folded, it's not going to interact. So you have to check these kind of things. But this is information at the residue level, at the amino acid level, which is, of course, useful. What you see a lot these days are uh, cross-linking experiments uh, coupled with mass spectrometry as a detection method. So here you are using small chemicals that have typically two warheads, and they are connected by a flexible linker. Those warheads, uh, the classical one attached to lysine side chain on the surface of proteins, and since there are two warheads, they are going to, collect, to connect to two lysines, provided they are uh, at the maximum possible distance, in, uh, at, uh, at the right distance in space. Now, the distance depends on the linker, and there are different chemistries there. Uh, you do this experiment in solution. Of course, you might get cross-links that are intramolecular, and you will also get cross-links that are intermolecular. And then the detection is to digest of protein with proteases, and you detect the fragment peptides. And from time to time, you go, you're going to detect peptides that are connected by the linker. And this is giving you now distance information between specific residues. That distance is not going to be very accurate. You will have an upper limit, which depends on the linker that you are using, which might be up to 30 angstrom. And the lower limit, you don't know, because you don't know if the linker is extended or it might be folded. Okay, so you can impose upper limits. But this is very, uh, so the detection by MS is very sensitive. So you can do these experiments with very little amount of sample. And these days, people are even able to do these experiments in living cells. So you can do the cross-linking in living cells, detect the complex that are present in a cell. Of course, you have to lyse the cell, uh, digest the proteins to do the detection, but the experiment can be done in living cells. So that's very useful information. HD exchange is another experimental technique that you can use to map interfaces. So here you do two types of experiments, one with the isolated protein, one with the complex, and you're going to compare those. Uh, you dissolve your protein in D2O, and all the exchangeable protons are going to exchange for deuterons. And then you can detect that by MS again, also by NMR, it's possible. And the regions that are protected from exchange might indicate the binding site. Okay, so this is information again which is potentially useful. Uh, since it's MS, you don't need a lot of sample to do this kind of information. Uh, you might not only detect binding site, but you might also detect allosteric effects. 
Uh, does everyone know what allostery is when I mention allostery? Yes? Okay. NMR uh, was also, uh, or is also a method which allows you to detect interactions. Uh, so here now you need uh, to label one of your protein and you can run uh, experiments where you are basically corre correlating the protons that are attached to a nitrogen 15. So you need to li label your, pro uh, your proteins. And in these experiments, you will see one signal per amino acid. On average, there are a few side chain and there's one amino acid that you don't see. Which amino acid has no NH? Chemistry question, I guess. One chance out of 20 to get it right. Hmm? Proline, yes, exactly. So you don't see prolines in these uh, experiments. So what do you do? So you're only looking at one of the components of your complex, and then you titrate another molecule in solution. And if something binds, you expect the signal to shift in your experiments. It depends on the binding strength, but uh, so if you have weak binding, you will see a shift of signal. This one is not shifting, so these are different concentrations of the second molecule that you're adding. And this is pinpointing basically the binding site on the surface of your protein. Again, you will detect allosteric effects here. This is used a lot also in the pharma industry to, do, to screen for small drugs. If you want to know, is the small molecule binding? but also where is it binding? It's very useful information. So again, all the information that we have seen now doesn't tell you how they are binding. They are just telling you where something is binding. Maybe only the crosslinks is giving you really a distance information between two points, but everything else is giving you bits, bits pieces of the puzzle. More NMR, and then uh, experiments like small angle X-ray scattering, cryo-EM, if you are still stuck at low resolution, is going to give you shape information, which is also valuable. Then you can start docking into these shapes. So this is information, and there are plenty of methods uh, that you can use to derive bits uh, of information. And if you don't have any exper experimental data, it's not the end of the day, because you can rely on bioinformatics, maybe, to predict things. And uh, for example, in sequence, so if you do sequence alignment, you might Often you associate sequence conservation as this is important for defining the fold of your protein. Now, if you start seeing conservation of amino acid on the surface of a protein, it must be for a good reason. And usually that reason is that this is involved in a binding site maybe, or it's an active site of an enzyme. So there's information in sequence, and there are many software that have been uh, developed over the year to do that. And we have developed quite some time ago a software called Whiskey for doing that because it's a good combination with Haddock. At least uh, Haddock has nothing to do with the fish. Okay, you will see later on. So Haddock is the, the captain, the friend of Tintin. So he's kind of, uh, he's swearing a lot, he's drinking a lot, he likes whiskey. So that was uh, the reason why we gave, we gave the name. So anyway, so there are plenty of software where you can try to predict based on sequence and based on structure as well, try to predict where things are binding. And this is also information. And uh, so we also have a consensus uh, server which combines different software into a consensus prediction, kind of a meta server to predict those. So this is just a snapshot of the server. Let's move on. So what do you do with all those data? Okay, they, they are not telling you how things interact, but they are useful. So you can decide to use the data a posteriori. So you use your favorite modeling software you're going to generate a lot of models, and then you use the data to filter the solutions. The other way will be to use the data a priori to transform the information that you have in some kind of energy function, which you're going to use during the docking, during the optimization process to guide the search. And this is the route that we have been taking in developing Haddock. So, I think I will go very fast on those aspects. So I already explained you, so you have, uh, in principle, six degrees of freedom. You need to sample space. Um, and there are different approach to that. But again, I think this is kind of a repetition of what you probably heard. Uh, so there are rigid body docking software in which molecules are treated as rigid. There is no flexibility possible. So all the fast Fourier transformation technique-based methods are following this, uh, meaning that the models that you're going to get at the end will have typically clashes at the interface. You will have to do some 
refinement after hand. Uh, and there are also, on the other side, there are the energy-driven methods where you're going to use energy minimization, uh, Monte Carlo, genetic algorithms to, to search this interaction space. So now you're no longer going to systematically sample all possible solutions, but you're going to search your energy landscape. So this is like looking for the lowest altitude point in Switzerland in a complex uh, energy landscape. So here you will have to sample, also increase your sampling, because depending on where you start your search in Switzerland, you will get stuck in local minima. So you have to have a strategy or to do that. Now flexibility, so flexibility makes everything harder. Uh, it means that you have an increased number of degrees of freedom, so you need to start describing side chain motion, you need to describe backbone conformational changes, so everything becomes more complicated. And what, also, uh, what is also a problem now is that the scoring becomes also more complicated, because your energy landscape uh, changes, becomes much more rugged and complex, and although it might be a better approach to put flexibility, it might just give you a, trouble, uh, a problem in identifying then what are good solutions. Another problem, and that's still pretty much a challenge in the field, it's very hard to predict a priori if a molecule is going to change its conformation when it's binding to its partner. There are plenty of modeling methods that allow you to study, say, mechanical properties of proteins. So you might be able to predict that the protein is going to do this kind of motion by running molecular dynamic simulations or an elastic network model or whatever method. If the binding site in this example is in my back, this motion is completely irrelevant for the docking in principle. And usually, if you play a lot of tricks, you, you, you use complex methods to generate a lot of conformation, and you don't need those for the binding process, you are complicating, again, the entire modeling process. You're going to generate a lot of different uh, models for your complex, and you might have a very hard time to distinguish what are the good ones from the bad ones. So it's, uh, my advice in modeling in general is to start as simple as possible, and if things don't work, move to the next level and introduce a higher level of, of uh, description of your model. But we are unable to, well, predicting conformational changes is still very much a challenge. Okay, so flexibility is also a challenge. Uh, so most methods uh, can only deal with rather small changes. So there are benchmarks that we use in the field for protein, protein docking, uh, where we know the structure of the free proteins and we know the structure of the complex, and they are classified in different categories uh, in terms of difficulty for the docking. And everything which has a conformational change of more than two, 2.5 angstrom, so these are not large changes, these are still rather small changes. Everything above 2.5 falls under the difficult category. Okay, so docking approach are never going to fold an alpha helix on the binding site. So you will have to, approach, to use different approach for that. Okay, so if you expect that you have huge conformational changes, you will have to do something different because the, the classical docking approach are not going to work for those. They are very limited. So intrinsically disordered proteins that only fold upon binding to their targets, they are very difficult to model. And how you treat flexibility depends on the choices that you make in the representation of the system. So if you use FFT-based methods, which use grids, then you have a rigid system, for example. Okay, now scoring, in principle, this is the holy grail, because if you have the perfect scoring function, the remaining of the problem is just computing time, because then you can generate billions of models. If your scoring function is perfect, you're going to find the solution to your problem. Our scoring functions are not perfect. Uh, they depend on the system, how you represent the system. They depend on the flexibility. And you see also in the field that people are developing functions that are specific to a given type of problems, optimized for antibody-antigen complexes, optimized for molecule, small molecule docking. So there is not a universal scoring function that works for everything. So what do you find in there? All kind of energetic terms, typically. Intermolecular energies, electrostatic, van der Waals, you might have hydrogen bondings, the amount of surface which is buried at the interface. Uh, so protein-protein complexes, it is used a lot. Dissolvation energy, uh, statistics, amino acid interface,
propensities or maybe even atom-atom uh, contact propensities that are derived from analysis of complexes in a PDB. So any combination of those will be uh, found there. And of course, if you have data, you can use the data in the scoring step as well. What is also often done is uh, not to look at individual models that you are generating, but you're going to cluster the solution so that you uh, assess the ensemble of models that you have been generating on a cluster basis. This kind of simplifies a bit the analysis because you will have usually less clusters than the number of models that you generate. Some software even use the size of the cluster as a scoring term. Uh, it depends very much how you do the search, if you can do this or not. Okay, now let's move now to more specifics of Haddock. By the way, if there is any question or something which is unclear at any time, just stop me and ask. Don't wait until the end. Yes? Good. So Haddock has been developed for more than 15 years now as an integrative modeling platform. And you find back here all the experimental data sources that we have been discussing. So we can integrate all of this data in some kind of energy function. Uh, currently, the new version of Haddock is able to handle up to 20 different molecules at the same time. So we're not speaking only about binary docking, but we can build multi-component assemblies in one go. Um, I didn't speak about symmetry, but symmetry is also information. So if you know that you, should, you are dealing with a symmetrical complex, you can impose that in your search. Uh, so that's uh, useful. We allow for flexibility at the interface. So we have a refinement stage where we allow for flexibility along the side chain and, and the backbone. And we have been, over the years, uh, performing uh, among the top groups in Capri. So how do we encode this information? So you know that some residues are important for the binding, but you don't know which contact they make. And then you have to define some energy function based on this information. So the way we do that is by using what we call ambiguous distances. And this is a concept that has, which is coming from NMR. It was uh, introduced by uh, Michael Nilges in 91 to deal with the ambiguity in the assignment of NMR signals. But basically what we are, uh, so if you have a number of amino acids that you have identified at the interface on one side, as these are important, and you have, uh, the same thing on the other side. So these are also amino acids that you have identified as being part of the interaction. Uh, we distinguish two categories in Haddock. We say these are the, the, the active ones are the one for which you have data. You say, okay, this is an important residue. So in principle, it should be at the interface. And then we usually add, increase the definition of the interface by selecting all the neighbors of those active residues. Because experimentally, you're never going to fully sample the interface. So you're usually missing information. Since we want to use the information to guide the modeling, for us it's important to have a good coverage of the active side, rather than having very accurate few predictions. So we have these uh, active residue red ones, we have these what we call passive grid ones, and we're going to calculate all possible distances between all atoms of one active residue on this side, and all atoms of all active and passive on this side. Let's assume that we have on average 10 atoms per amino acid. So if I have one active on one side and 10 on the other side, you can calculate 1,000 individual distances. So these are all the atom-atom combinations, okay? Those distances you're going to sum using this function, one over distance to the sixth power. So this is dipole-dipole interactions. So this is kind of the NMR, uh, an NMR energy function, but this is also the attractive part of a lennard john potential, if you think of Van der Waals interaction. So this sum, and then you take the inverse six root of this sum, and this is giving you one effective distance. This distance has the property that it's going to be shorter than any distance that enter the sum. And then we use this distance in some kind of harmonic potential to define a restraint to guide the docking. So effectively what we have, we have this network of ambiguous distances that are going to bring the interface together, but they are not predefining in which orientation the binding should take place because you could have any combinations because we calculate all distances, okay? If you have a cross-link, you know exactly which pair should be 
uh, defined, but if you just have interface information, you don't know what the contact should be. And these ambiguous distance restraints allow for any type of contact as long as the interface are coming together. Our energy function is not harmonic, but it becomes linear after some uh, region so that the forces becomes constant, which is helping for the uh, molecular dynamics type of simulation that we are doing. What we also do by default, because uh, we realize that the data are never perfect, so we randomly delete 50% of the information for each docking trial that we are doing. So in that way, you hope that you're going to get rid of false positive data in your data set, and then you hope to converge to the right solution. This also has the effect that from time to time, you're going to throw away the good information, and you're going to end up in bad region of the interaction space. And it would be up to your scoring function then to discriminate things. Next to that, we use a classical force field. So we describe all the bonds, the angles, rotation around bonds, and the non-bonded interaction. And we use a combination of energy minimization and molecular dynamic simulation to do the docking, actually. So molecular dynamics, I probably don't need to explain you that, but based on Newton's second law of motion. So once we have defined our energy function, we can calculate forces. And if we know the forces, we can integrate Newton's second law of motion to propagate the system as a function of time. And you get basically a molecular, molecular movie of your, of your system. And this is used to basically search uh, this energy landscape. Now, the docking protocol in Haddock consists of three stages. In the first stage, we treat the molecule as rigid, rock solid. And we are going to do here an energy minimization to bring the molecule together based on the data that we put in. In the second phase, we're going to heat up the system. So we do some kind of simulated annealing protocol, higher temperature, and then cooling down slowly. And at that stage, we introduce flexibility. And in the final stage, we solvate the system with a uh, a layer of water, and we do a very short molecular dynamics, extremely short. Nothing spectacular happens here, but it helps in the energetics of the system, and it helps in the scoring. Uh, so minimization, it's usually quite a fast uh, step, although there are software that are way faster than ours. But here we sample in the order of 10 to 100,000 solutions internally. We write maybe thousands to 10,000 to disk. Uh, so this is really the sampling, and the, the starting point are randomly orientated and separated molecules. We take uh, 10 to 20% of these rigid body solutions, and now we go through a flexible refinement stage. So now we do molecular dynamics in torsion angle space, and we introduce flexibility first along the side chain at the interface, and then along side chain and backbone. And at the end, uh, we refine in explicit solvent. We support two types of solvent. Uh, we have water using the T3P model, and we also have a DMSO uh, model to mimic membrane. Yes. So we are going, so our simulated and ending protocol starts, we start at high temperature. Mm -hmm. So it, we don't put position restraints to slowly release the system like you will do in molecular dynamics. Okay. This will take way too much time. Yeah. So the, the, the molecules are free to move from the start. Mm -hmm. And actually we start at high temperature, but we still have the restraints to keep the interface together. Okay, so you're not doing free dynamics there, otherwise bad things will happen, yes. Wow. So this is basically an illustration for two-body docking. So this will be the starting point, randomly rotated molecules. So one molecule here is at the center, and all the other one will be the second molecule. So they are oriented around the first one. And we do the first uh, rigid body minimization. Let's see if this works. So let's go back here. So this is what's happening in a computer. The residues that you see are spheres are the one for which we have some kind of information. In this case, we're NMR data. So this brings uh, your system together. And the result of that is since we have information about the binding side, you see that. So we super these are 200 solutions. 
superimposed on this blue protein here. So they all sample the same phase of that protein because there were data pointing to that region, but they are oriented in all kinds of different ways because we don't have specific contact defined. Okay, so this looks like spaghettis. So now we take uh, the top uh, typically 200 models and we go into a flexible stage. So now we're doing first rigid body dynamics and then you will see that we introduce flexibility along the side chain, so we optimize the interface. In the next phase, the backbone will also be optimized. Look at this loop here, it just flipped over. So in that way, you can describe small induced conformational changes. The amount of changes that you describe here is not going to be huge. It depends very much on the amount of data that you have in. So it might be one angstrom, maybe two angstrom if you're lucky. The more data you put in, the more conformational changes you might be able to induce. So we have seen cases where you can go up to four angstrom, five angstrom conformational changes using, for example, cryo-EM data. If you have no data at all, or there is an ab initio mode in, in, in ad hoc as well, the amount of changes that are happening during this phase is rather limited. So again, don't expect miracles. So what is the impact of this? So we still have multiple orientations here, but you see that we start seeing a convergence of solutions. So these were spaghettis. These are now linguine. And if you don't know what linguine are, you are in an Italian part of Switzerland, so ask to the Italian people here, they will explain. These are the flatter, uh, you take a spaghetti and you smash it and you get this flatter one. So at the end, we, we refine in solvent and then we do a clustering and we're going to assess the clusters to do our scoring. So the scoring is not based on individual model, the scoring is based on the clusters. And we calculate the average score on the best four model of each cluster. We don't use the cluster size in our scoring function, but we take the top four model of each. So in terms of flexibility, what do we have? Uh, we have an implicit way of dealing with flexibility, meaning we can do the modeling not from a single structure, but we can also start our modeling from an ensemble of conformation. So we're not going to do a docking run for each conformation, but we give an ensemble to the software and they are going to be used in that way. Uh, so you should not give too large ensembles because you have a dilution problem. If only one conformation is able to lead to the right solution, and you give 1,000 conformation, you only have one chance out of 1,000 to, to hit that conformation. Okay, so you want to limit the number of models. And then we have the explicit, uh, the other level of implicit flexibility. We do scale down intermolecular interactions between the, in the simulated and inning phase. And then we have the ex explicit level at side chain and backbone level, as you have seen in the movie. We do clustering. And then we calculate a rather simple score. So we have scores at different stages. So this is the rigid body, flexible, and water refinement score. And here, what do you find? So you find the intermolecular van der Waals energy, 20% of the electrostatic energy, intermolecular, a dissolvation energy term, and this term is actually from ribbon. So we, uh, we use this dissolvation. So this is telling you that if you bury hydrophobic groups at the interface, it's usually good because you remove water from hydrophobic surface. If you start burying charges, you're going to pay a price for it. Okay, so that's an empirical term which depends on the amount of surface accessible of the, of the atoms at the interface. And we have the experimental terms also in this scoring function. So this was optimized 16 years ago on maybe three, four complexes, so it's not a large data set. Uh, and also maybe chemical intuition a bit at the time. But it has survived 15 years of optimization. I have people in a group that like to do machine learning and come with nice models. And they improve a little bit the scoring for protein, protein, but that function doesn't work anymore for protein nucleic acid. So we use this function for pretty much everything. And the scoring functions are still limited in the accuracy. Okay, we don't have the perfect scoring function. So using 1.0 is nice and simple. You could maybe optimize the function by putting there 0.97337. In terms of accuracy, it's not going to make any difference. So again, keep things simple, simple when you can. So sense and simplicity is my motto. It should make sense, whatever approach you choose, and it should be simple. So start simple and go to the next level only if you need it. Some statistics from, uh, so this was CAS Capri round uh, 2014. 
slides from Shoshana Vodak. So at that time, we only participated as a web portal. Uh, it means we don't have to do ab initio modeling. So if we find data, we can put it in a portal, but you have to take the ranking that the portal is giving you. And these are the statistics from that round. So in that round, we are doing very well. In another round, we were somewhere down. Uh, so this is ad hoc, and this is the scoring. So Capri has two parts. One, you are trying to predict the complexes, and the other part, you are trying to score solutions, and you are given solutions from all the groups. So typically, you have a few thousand models, and you have to fish out which are the, the good ones. And we use the very simple function that I've shown you in that round. We didn't really look at things. We did things automatically. So this simple function, which might seem maybe naive, uh, is working well enough in this context in scoring models that are coming from different software, different groups. So most of our users are using Haddock through the web portal, and you're going to uh, use the web portal this afternoon in the tutorial. So we have uh, a large number of, of uh, docking grants that have been served over the years. It's active since 2008. And more than probably today, about 45% of all the docking has been performed on those high throughput compute resources that are distributed around Europe because of the support of EGI and those European projects here. So we are sending jobs mostly to European resource, but also China, Taiwan, uh, in the past also the US, the Open Science Grid. So we are able to provide these services because of this support. Uh, this is just uh, a view of our user base, so we have a nice coverage of the world. We have to work a bit on Africa, but otherwise it's quite nice. Uh, some recent development, some highlights. So I already mentioned that we can now go up to 20 molecules. So the new version, or, so the portal we just saw is handling a maximum of six molecules. And the new version, which actually you're going to use this afternoon in the tutorial, can go up to 20 and can also support uh, cryo-electron uh, microscopy data. So for if you are at lower resolution, if you have high resolution data in cryo-EM, you don't need to do docking. You can build your model straight into the maps. But there will be cases where the resolution is still limited, where you might need to go to the docking approach. So now we can handle this kind of data as well. So we are part of the BioXL Center of Excellence, uh, which is a European project. And tomorrow, the two lecturers that you will have are also part of this, uh, of this project. And as part of this project, we have a forum for HADOC where you can find a lot of information. So it's, it's a help center, basically. A lot of questions have been asked and answered. Uh, so you can search. If you want to post question, you will have to register. But if you are looking for an answer, it might already be there. Although people usually tend not to look for answers, but ask the same question again and again. It's probably the nature of human. Okay, so next to Haddock, which is our, say, our flagship software, we also have a number of other servers that we are providing that are doing different things. Uh, this is for NMR structure calculations. Uh, this is for predicting the binding affinity of, uh, of a complex, a very simple model, no free energy calculation. Uh, this I might talk about uh, later. Bioinformatic predictions, hotspot predictions. So these are residue that, if mutated, should give a change in binding affinity of at least 2 kcal per mole. And we have also some uh, cryo -EM fitting software there and modeling of DNA. All of it accessible through this website. Okay, let's move now to some application example of what can we do with these kind of, uh, of approaches. Now the first one uh, is a story about iron piracy. So this is a, a receptor protein which is, uh, it's a bacterial receptor. And the bacteria needs iron for its survival. And to get the iron, it's actually hijacking a small protein from its host, a ferredoxine protein, which contains an iron sulfur cluster. So there are two iron atoms per protein in that one. So to get, to grab these irons, the, uh, the, the bacteria needs to internalize ferredoxine. And it does that through this receptor. And by the way, this is Captain Haddock. If you don't know him, that's the, the guy we are usually referring to. So uh, in this group of people here, they, were, uh, they are crystallographers, they are NMR people, and they are modelers, us. Um, so they try, of course, to first crystallize the complex, but they never managed to co-crystallize with uh, ferredoxin. So they got a nice crystal structure of the receptor, 
And this was the first structure that contained all the loops well resolved. Um, but no, nothing about the complex. Still, if you look at this structure, there's information because you know which part is in principle in the membrane. And you also know which loops are the extracellular loop, the one which should actually grab ferredoxin. So this is information. So since that could not crystallize the complex, they resolved to NMR to study the other partner, ferredoxin. And they, do, they did this HSQC experiment that I, I, I showed you before. And what you see in this plot is the sequence, the amino acid sequence in terms of numbers. And this will be the displacement of the signal in the spectra when you do this titration experiment. And you see that there are specific regions along the sequence that are affected by the binding. So now you're looking at ferredoxin and you are titrating the receptor in solution. If you look at this on the 3D structure of ferredoxin, this defines a well-defined interface. This is information that we're going to give to Haddock. Now on the receptor, in principle, we, can, we cannot do the NMR of the receptor, but we have information about the extracellular loop. So what we're going to tell Haddock is that this region of ferredoxin should be binding somewhere on the surface of the receptor, which is on the outside. Okay? And if you do that, this is, what, uh, this is the top two cluster that you are getting. So this is the, the cluster number one, which is also the largest. Uh, if you look at the score, so this is the Haddock score, this simple combination of electrostatic Van der Waals dissolvation. Uh, look at the standard deviations. So you could not say that this is a much better solution than this one. They are overlapping. Okay, so actually, you should look at both solutions. Uh, this is a view of the top solution. So based on this model, the next step would be, and this was not done in the publication, but this is follow-up work, to propose mutations at the interface of this complex that will validate this model. So if you have two sets of solutions, you should look which mutations should I make to try to distinguish between the solutions. And then you can go back to the lab, test it, and then validate one of those two models, and potentially use the data that you generate to improve your model. Another example using NMR data in this case, uh, as you know, proteins are uh, ubiquitinated, so proteins are ubiquitinated to tag them for degradation, but it can also be a signaling pathway. And there are different ways of, of connecting ubiquitin because they are, so the connections is for lysine to the C-terminal, so it's an isopeptide bond, and there are different ways, there are more lysines. But in this particular example, there were two different uh, connections that uh, we were interested to look at. Actually, Annalisa Pastor in London was interested to look at uh, so there's an enzyme called josephine, which cleaves ubiquitin before the substrate is degraded. So we want to avoid degrading ubiquitin. We want to reuse ubiquitin to tag other proteins. And the question they were uh, asking was, is there a preference for the enzyme for lysine 48 or lysine 63 linkage? Again, they could not solve the, the, by classical NMR the structure of the complex, but there was information about the binding site. So from chemical shift perturbation experiments, there were two binding sites identified on Josephine, one on this side, one on this side. There were also some mutation data. So this is information that we're going to use. And next to that, there is another piece of information. It's the catalytic triad. It's an enzyme. It has to clear the peptide bond. So in our modeling, if the enzyme is to work, a terminus of one ubiquitin should come close to this catalytic triad. In principle, we could use this as information as well, but we did not. It's always good if you can afford to have some data that you don't, do not use in your modeling so that you can validate your model based on the data that you set aside. Since we didn't know uh, which uh, connectivity is it lies in 48 or 63, what we did was a free body docking to ubiquitin, Josephine, those data, plus one additional distance restraint, an ambiguous restraint, which connects one ubiquitin, the C-terminal of one ubiquitin, to either lysine 63 or lysine 48. Okay, so that's again an ambiguous distance. It can be one or the other, it doesn't matter. And then we dock using this information, and then you look what you're getting at the end. So what are you getting at the end? You get models in which you recover the, C, the 48 linkage, 
So you see the two ubiquitin, and in this conformation, you see that the C terminal of the first one is coming nice at proximity of the catalytic triad. Of course, you also get the 63 linkage because it's allowed by the data. So if your sampling is good, you should get this information as well. And this, the second ubiquitin has kind of the same conformation, but the first one now is rotated. If you look at the helix here, you can see the difference in orientation. And this makes that the C terminal now is moving away from the catalytic triad. Okay, so based on this information, our preferred model was this one, meaning that the enzyme should have a preference for the 48 linkage because it's putting it in the right conformation for the catalysis to take place. Now, if you do the biochemical experiment, this is indeed what you are seeing. This is time, and this is the percentage of product, of reaction product, so the cleave ubiquitin. You see the enzyme is still able to cleave the 63 linkage, but not so efficiently. If you have the 48 linkage, it's much more efficient. So we have a model that explains basically the biochemistry of the system. It might not be a fully accurate model, but it's good enough to explain uh, what we observe. Now we spoke also about uh, data that you can collect by MS. So let's have a look at this kind of data. Uh, this is the work of uh, Adrien, former postdoc in my group. And this has to do with uh, uh, the modeling of a bacterial circadian clock machinery. Do you all know what a circadian clock is? Some yes, some nothing. So, so it's the reason why Ruben is jet lagged. Uh, I think you are the only one coming from, uh, from the US. Okay, so we have a clock machinery in our cells that are basically keeping track of, uh, of time. Uh, so this clock has a given frequency and when you travel abroad to over time zones, it takes quite some time until you adjust the clock. So it's a molecular clock. And uh, the one that we are interested at in this case was a, a cyanobacteria clock. And the interesting part about this one is that you only need three proteins, K, A, B, and C. So if you express those proteins, you mix them in a test tube, you add ATP, and you add phosphate, and the clock starts ticking. That's all you need. How do you know the clock is ticking? You can monitor phosphorylation, dysphosphorylation by MS. So you do MS experiments at different time points, and you see that there is a phosphorylation, dysphosphorylation of specific sites, and you can measure the frequency of the clock, okay? So that's really a molecular clock, just mix things and hope magic happens. Uh, at that time, there was no structural information on how this works. There were structures of the component for KB and KC, but we didn't know how they interact. So what was the information that we had from native MS? So in native MS, you are not digesting your protein and cutting them in fragments, but you are looking at the full complex, which is flying in the spectrometer. So you know the stoichiometry, and that's the first piece of information that you need if you want to model complexes. In this case, it's six to one. So six KB are binding to one KC. And then we also had HD exchange data. I explained you this type of data before. So this is now giving us information about the potential binding region on the surface of those proteins. So if you look at KB, so this was the crystal structure uh, which was available at the time. If you map the HD exchange data, it indicates that these helices seems to be the binding site. There were some additional data from mutagenesis, so we're going to use all those data for the modeling. This is KC, so KC is a much larger uh, protein. Uh, you can see that there is a six-fold symmetry when you look from the top. Um, so they are still, it, this explains the six-to-one uh, binding. It's kind of a double donut because you can open it and you see that there is a hole in the center. And all the blue regions are the regions that are affected when KB is binding. So there are changes in HD exchange protection. And you see that we have a problem. We see now six binding sites on the top. We see six binding sites at the bottom. So that's 12 already. And if you open your donut, there is even change in protection at the interface between those. So what's happening, we have again here an allosteric process. So something happens, something binds either at the top or at the bottom, and the signal is transmitted to the other side. And this is controlling this phosphorylation, dephosphorylation. 
So what did we do at the time? We say, well, let's select one binding site here and one binding site at the bottom. So this is the C1 binding and this is C2 binding, and we're going to do two docking experiments, one targeting the top, one targeting the bottom. So if you do that, you end up with a set of, uh, of complexes for the top solution. You end up with a set of complexes for the bottom solution. And we could not really distinguish based on the score which one was better. We had one piece of information that we did not use in the modeling, which I did not mention yet. It's what is called collision cross-section. So in MS, you can do an experiment where if you do native MS, your, your protein complex is flying in the vacuum of the spectrometer against a gas flow of, of small molecule ions. And you can measure the time it takes for that molecule to bridge a given distance. And depending on the shape of the molecule, this time will vary. Just think a cigar will fly differently from a donut because of the hydrodynamic properties of the system. Okay, so in MS, you can measure this time and you can relate this time to this collision cross-section. And if you have a structure, if you have a model, you can back calculate what this collision cross-section should be and compare to your experimental data. Now, this is what we did for all those clusters. So the orange one are the top solutions, the green one are the bottom solutions, and the two dotted line is the experimental range for this collision cross-section. So based on this experimental data, we decided that probably the orange one is the right solution, and this is our best score cluster for the orange one, which is nicely in the middle. So we basically at that time predicted this being a model of the binding of KB to KC. This was published in uh, PNIS at the time, and everyone was happy. Then two years later, a cryo-EM model or structure came out, which showed a full complex, KA, KB, KC. And this structure revealed that this is the correct model. Okay, so I told you garbage in, garbage out. So this is an example of the danger of modeling. Usually you might never speak about those things. You just bury them and forget about them. But uh, this is a good learning moment, okay? Things will go wrong when you do experiments, when you do modeling, you just have to accept that and you should not bury bad data or things that you don't like, but you should learn from them. So what went wrong? In this case, we selected our model based on experimental data, okay? So actually the data pointed us to the wrong model, actually. So we can blame the experimental data. That's a bit easy, but uh, Talking to experimental people, MS people, uh, they also told me, well, you are dealing with a molecule which is not globular. So KC has this hole inside. So when you do those experiments, you know it's a bit dangerous because there could be compactation of the structure. So what you are measuring is an underestimate of what you would have in solution. So that's one thing. So that could explain why the data do not match the model. But there's another issue here, and that's nature playing tricks with us. So the crystal structure that we used at the time was the four that I show you. At the same time, they published the cryo -EM structure. Another crystal structure of KB was published. And this is a comparison of the secondary structure of those two crystal structures. These are the same sequence, okay? There's no difference, it's the same protein. But look at this one, so this, has, this is alpha, uh, beta, alpha, beta. So the first part is similar, okay, no problem. But look at the second part. We have beta, alpha, alpha, beta, and here we have alpha, beta, beta, alpha. So it's a complete change in the fold of the protein. Same sequence, two completely different folds. So hopefully this is not happening too often. The crystallization conditions were different. Uh, this is a quote from the paper. And uh, so there is this, uh, what they say, this highly populated in inactive tetrameric form that's the GS1, and that's the structure that we had at the time when we did our modeling. And then this is the one that was published at the same time as the cryo -M data. So switch in fold because of change of crystallization condition or concentration, so something happened there. So we have to hope that this is not happening too often, otherwise we are in big trouble and you cannot trust anything in a PDB. Okay, there are other examples of proteins where you just need to do one mutation and the fold changes completely. Okay, so, so we are sometimes in meta-stable states, I guess, in terms of protein structure, and small differences can induce large conformational changes. But, okay, this is really the exception. So now, so uh, we have been revisiting this, uh, this system, so we are dealing with a large system, so small intermezzo, 
Another development in Haddock is that we have been introducing the Martini force fields now in Haddock so that we can do coarse grain modeling. Basically, we represent in Martini, Martini is not ours, it's developed in Groningen, the group of Sieverty and Marink. So we are mapping four atoms into one particle. So we have a four to one mapping, meaning that we have less particle that we need to consider in our modeling. It also has the advantage that it smoothens a bit the energy landscape. So we are winning time and we might have a smoothened energy landscape. Uh, so this is now out, uh, this has just been published in the GCTC. Uh, that's the Martini uh, reference, but the Haddock Martini paper is out also in GCTC. So we took now the KC molecule, we took the same information that we used in the previous work, so HD exchange mutagenesis. <coughs> Instead of docking one KB onto one binding site, so now we're going to dock six KB simultaneously onto KC, so it's a, it's a seven body docking problem. We do that at, at the coarse grain level, and if you do that, you see that now uh, the C1 uh, model, which is the bottom binding site, which is the cryo-EM uh, structure, has a score in terms of Haddock score, which is way better than the top model. So now we are able to distinguish in terms of score using the correct fold of KB. Uh, it's about seven-fold speed up in terms of computational time. And you can take those models uh, and fit it into the cryo-EM map. Uh, we did that using camera. And you get a correlation for the docked model of 0.82. And if you take the cryo-EM structure, which is about five angstrom resolution that was deposited, you get 0.84, okay? So it's not so bad. Again, it's a model, it's not perfect. There are still small differences, but uh, considering we are doing a seven body docking, it's quite an amazing result. Okay. So now, uh, last part before the multiple choice. So we should have a little bit of time to address some the topic of your choice. So we've been, speaking so far a lot about using data to, uh, to model things. And I've shown you example also when things went wrong because there were problems in the data or there were problems in the structure. And uh, so it will be nice to be able to actually measure or assess the reliability of the data and the information content of the data before you take the step to modeling a complex. Okay, so can we clean up the data maybe in some way before using them? And this is very much related to the work that we've been doing on using cross-link data from mass spectrometry. Um, so again, this is a cartoon showing you the, the, the process of doing this cross-linking. The problem with cross-links, so they have these reactive heads that are highly reactive, and you might cross-link molecules that do not correspond to the stable native state of your complex. So you might have encounter complex, maybe on the way to the native complex, or maybe random collision in solution, which are reactive and you're going to detect crosslinks. So they are false positive data typically in the crosslinking experiments. I think if people want to get reliable data, what they often do is to repeat the experiments multiple time and see which crosslinks do I consistently detect over multiple experiments. And there are other statistics that you can use to try to improve the, the accuracy of your crosslinks. So, so the idea here, and this is the work of uh, Guido, a former PhD student, uh, was to try to uh, assess the information content of those crosslinks and possibly detect false positive before we use them for modeling in Haddock. So the question is given two structures and a set of distance restraints. So now we're speaking about crosslinks, but in principle you can do that with any type of distance information. So are there solutions that will satisfy a subset or all the restraints? Okay, that's the question. Now, a solution in this context is a complex that satisfies the restraints, and a complex is a conformation where the subunits are interacting, so there should be an interaction between them, and they are not clashing. So there is no energetics consideration in what we're going to do. It's purely geometry. We want the, the molecules should touch each other, but they should not overlap with the core. Now, the accessible interaction space is going to be defined as the set of all possible solutions that satisfy a given number of restraints. So is there a unique solution, or are there many solutions that are consistent with the data that you have? How are we going to do that? We are going to use docking tricks. So we're going back to fast Fourier transform-based docking techniques. 
these rigid body docking techniques. So we take the largest molecule, the receptor, <coughs> we map it onto a grid, we define a core in blue, so they should not be overlapped with the core, and we define the surface in gray, which will be, they should be overlapped with the surface to define an interaction. So this is kept rigid, fixed in space. Then we take our second molecule, which we call ligand. For that one, we're going to sample all possible rotations, and then we're going to do the translational search using FFT-based docking. And then we are doing counting, basically. So for each solution that we generate, we count, does it satisfy the distance restraint, yes or no? And this is done directly during the FFT search. And then you can visualize the accessible space around your receptor, which is consistent with a number of restraints. So this is an example where you have the receptor. <coughs> you see an orange point. This is the center of mass of the second molecule in the crystal structure of the complex. So that's where the true solution is. And the gray area is the area where you can put this center of mass while satisfying five of the distance restraints that we defined. These are these not very accurate cross-linking distance, upper limit 30 angstrom. So you see there's a large space which satisfies the information that you have. Again, no energetics. If you add more data, so now we're looking at seven restraints, you see that the space is shrinking. If there is no space which is consistent with the data that you're looking at, you know you have a problem. You must have inconsistent data, or there is a large conformational change. That could be the other problem. This is rigid body analysis, so there is no conformational change. So can we detect those false positive data in such a case? This is such an example. Uh, RNA polymerase 2, uh, we know the complex. There are six experimental crosslinks that have been described in literature, and we added two false positive ones. So the upper limit for this distance is 30 angstrom. That's what we're using. We added one which is 42 angstrom and one which is 36 angstrom. So in principle, this should not be possible. And then the question is, using this type of analysis, are we able to recover those false positives? Now, this is uh, some statistics of, the, of what's happening. So, this is the, so these are all the solutions in which the two molecules are in contact. Okay, so that's, that's not the number of solutions that we sample, but these are all the solutions where in the, they are in contact. Our sampling was a one angstrom grid side and 5.3 degree rotations. So this is a very large number. So this is 190 billion solutions. Okay. Now you start adding restraints and you see that this is shrinking, but it's not shrinking very fast. Look at free distance restraints. We still have 300 million solutions that are possible that are consistent with free distance restraints. If you add accurate distance restraints, the perfect measurement, there should only be one solution possible. Okay, if you want to orient two planes, think of mathematics, a plane is described by three points. So if you measure a free distance between two, the, 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 the two planes, you are able to orient exactly the plane how they should be. And that will be the same for protein-protein or for biomolecule interactions. But our distance are not accurate. They have this upper limit, 30 angstrom, and the lower limit is basically zero. So you have a, la a large interval. And as you go down, so now at six, we have still five million solutions that are consistent. Seven, 10,000, eight, zero. Okay, so if you use all the data, you have no single consistent solution. So you know you have a problem. And now the question is, can we identify those? So what we're going to do is actually look at those 10,000 solutions here. So we start from the bottom, we look at those 10,000, and we look which distance out of the eight is most often violated in those 10,000 solutions. Okay, so you can calculate a fraction of violation for each distance restraint that you have in your set. And this is what is shown in this table. So this is the number of restraints that you are looking at. So for eight, there was zero models. So for seven distance, we have 10,000 models to look at. And then you see which distance is most often violated. You see that number eight is always violated. Okay, it's not consistent with any solution, basically. So we have identified our first false positive. Now you can go back and now look at five million solutions and do the same analysis. And if you do that, you see that there are now number seven and eight, which start to be highly violated. Seven is 99.7. And if you now look further up in this matrix, you see that there are, the violations start to be spread over the, over the matrix. 
Now you can do some statistics, calculate average set score, and we came up with a way of basically uh, predicting which one are the, the false positive. When you do this analysis, there is another benefit. Okay? If you have consistent data, uh, you have this distance information, but you can also look at all the consistent model that you generated and basically look at the interface that are used in those models when the protein interacted. Okay, so you can count which residue on the surface is most often making contact with the other molecule. So you're doing a surface mapping of the interface which is consistent with the data, the distances that you put in. And this is defining the surface of a protein which in principle you could use in your modeling as well. Okay, so now you're extracting information, you're deriving information from the distance information into more like an interface information. Now this is available as a web portal. It's making use of uh, GPGPU computing for speeding up the search. And the portal is giving you a guided interpretation of the results where we are flagging the possible false positive restraints, uh, color coding them based on some Z-score calculation. And you get this view of the accessible space as a function of the number of restraints. So these are pre-calculated view. These are not interactive view. But you can get an idea before you were to use those data for any modeling are the data consistent, at least. This is not limited to crosslink data. This is an example of how the space changes using now NMR data. These are nuclear over Isaac distances. So here we have a set of 56 distances, and we are just decreasing, showing how the interaction space, the accessible space, shrinks as a function of the number of distances. NMR NOE distances are much more accurate than crosslinks. Still, it's amazing to see if you see halfway here, you have 25 distance restraints, and there's still a huge space which is accessible. Again, there's no energetics here, it's purely geometry. And if you put all the data in there, you, you converge to the one solution, which is actually the NMR structure of this complex. So uh, this kind of approach allows you to visualize the information content in principle of any type of data distance-based information. It allows you to identify possible false positive. Uh, of course, it's a rigid body docking approach, so if you are dealing with conformational changes, that's not going to work very well. So now we have about 50 minutes left for questions or another topic. So these are the multiple choices, okay? So I told you about 20 topics. I hope you can read them, so I give you one minute and then we vote. Some of them we already handled, so you can forget about uh, what is it. Uh, the this vis thing is somewhere there. Uh, MS data we already handled, and then uh, this one we also handled. Okay. So we have time for one, okay? And, and maybe this afternoon, if the tutorial is goes too fast, we might do another one. But yeah. Okay. So. What would you choose? So who calls? First shot. Anyone? Is, well, maybe you are fed up with me and we stop and we go for lunch. That's also OK. Yes? Protein DNA. Protein DNA. Another suggestion. Yes? Peptide. Anyone else interested in something else? Yes? Antibody antigen. So three topics. Binding affinity, four topics. I think we should stop here because it's coming. So, so. so you had your chance. If you didn't call, then so now we have four. So, who is four? So we had sorry. You may have an answer two hours if you want. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we had uh, who is for protein nucleic acid? Uh, only one vote, though. Okay. Who is for protein nucleic acid? Raise your hand. Uh, bad luck. Huh? Two, protein peptides. Uh, that's one, two, three, four, six, okay? Uh, binding affinity. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay? And then the last one was, uh, yeah, antibody antigens. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh. So that's, uh, so yeah, but you don't count. Okay, students, so it seems like the binding affinity story has the, is the winner. And then antibody antigen is number two, so maybe later on uh, this afternoon we can cover it, uh, depending on time. Okay, so I have to find where it is now. Um, binding affinity is all down there. 
Why is my mouse? Hmm. No. Do you see a mouse somewhere? Ah, this is not good. Ah, here it is. Binding affinity, yes. Okay. So binding affinity is, uh, there's probably too much information, so I would have to skip a few things. So a dream will be to use docking. So assume we have all the proteins in a proteome. So you could think, I'm going to use docking. I'm going to dock everything against everything. And some people have been trying to do that, actually. You have a few papers reporting that. It has not been very successful so far. Or if it was successful, it was for the wrong reason. Uh, no comments here. So you could dock everything against everything, but that's not going to give you so the, the, the answer. That's not going to predict your interactor. Scoring functions, we didn't speak much about scoring function in terms of binding affinity, but they do not correlate with binding affinity. For sure not for protein proteins. Maybe in small molecule field it's different, but for protein protein not. I'm going to show you that. So if you have all those models, so assuming your scoring is perfect, you're going to get the best model for each complex that you, you predict. You will have to predict the binding affinity because the binding affinity is going to define if the complex is going to take place in real life or not, depending on the concentration of the proteins in the cell. So you also need to know the concentration if you want to do all of that. So uh, what we started doing at the time, and that's the work of Panos, a former PhD student, is say, okay, let's, we're not going to do this docking exercise. That's way too much time. Let's take crystal structure. So we know we have, in principle, the perfect structure, maybe crystal state, but that's our reference point. So given the perfect structure, can we predict the binding affinity of the complex? Okay, that's the question we want to answer. So we need a benchmark for that. So you need to find cases where, again, you have the free form structure of your proteins, you have the structure of the complex, and we have binding affinity data. And that's not simple to put together because the binding affinity data tends to be buried in papers. Um, so in a collaboration between several groups in the docking field, we put out this benchmark, uh, and it has been updated since. So here we had about 140 entries. And then using this benchmark, we calculated uh, we, the scores for different scoring function in docking. So we have our own ad hoc score, but we use Rosetta, Z-Rank, Attract, uh, PISA server, which is used by the PDB. And we basically calculated the correlation with those binding affinities. And to make a long story short, this is what you're getting, an R square of zero. Okay? No correlation between scoring function and binding affinity. This is also the reason why in ad hoc we never put units to our scores. Okay? These are arbitrary units. We don't want people to think that this is a binding affinity. And these are some of the correlations that you are getting if you are doing this exercise. So there are some of them look better than others, but there is no predicting power in any of those scoring functions if you look at those graphs. So ad hoc is in there. Uh, so some of them are, are not, if you take a subset of the data, you start seeing correlation. So this is the best function, and it gives you an R of minus 0.5, not R squared, but R, okay? Now this puts you in this gray area in terms of correlations, and this is, again, if you want to do predictions based on that, it still looks very much like potatoes, your distribution of points no predictive power. So the first model of binding affinity was uh, from uh, Horton and Lewis. It was published in 92. At the time, they had 10 complexes, and they were getting correlations of 0.9 between the buried surface area of the complex and the binding affinity. Okay, so the amount of surface at the interface was correlating very strongly with the binding affinity. Now, if you use the same model, uh, you can retrain the model using the data that we have now, 140 complex. You get for the BSA uh, correlation of about 0.53. And the best energetic model, very fancy energy function, gives you about the same values. Okay, so you can simply take BSA as a proxy of binding affinity and you get about 0.5. And these correlations, they only hold for the complex that are characterized as rigid binders. 
So there are no conformational changes upon binding. And here the limit was put at one angstrom. Okay, so if there's less than one angstrom conformational changes, um, we, we qualify it as rigid binder. So you get this correlation. Point five, if you look at all the system where there are larger conformational changes, your correlations are gone. So that's bad news for these simple methods. So what are you missing here? Uh, many things. Uh, there might be limitation in the quality of the data. Again, so these sets of data, they have been measured in different labs by different methods. So it, it, it will be extremely nice for the field to have a data set measured in a consistent way on a large set of complexes. It's simply not there. Uh, there might be ambiguity of crystal coordinates. We might be missing cofactors. We might be missing water, maybe, uh, ions, so the solvent. And what we are doing when we're doing docking, we usually score only on the bound state. We neglect the free state in most cases. This is a free energy landscape. This is a reaction coordinate. So here we have the free states, and here we have the complex. So here I have a complex of a sphere with a triangle, and I have a complex of a triangle with a square. In terms of uh, free energy, they have the same free energy in their bound state, but they have different binding affinities because their free state are different. Okay, so part of the equation, part of the problem, if you want to predict this, if you're doing scoring and you score on the interface, you're going to predict the same binding affinity for those two. Because in this case, in this example, the answer is actually in the free state. So uh, in doing this work, we also uh, discovered quite interesting correlations. Uh, namely, that there is also a correlation between binding affinity and the percentage of polar amino acid on the non-interacting surface. So the surface of the contact of the complex, which is not involved in a binding. And that's surprising. And you also have these correlations with the percentage of charge amino acid. So for the, you get about minus 40, 0.48 for the charge one and 0.42 for the polar one. Of course, correlation, correlation doesn't mean anything. Okay, so it's not because there is a correlation, there is a causality. There is a very strong correlation between eating chocolate and winning the Nobel Prize. Okay, so if you calculate what's the average consumption of chocolate per inhabitant per country, and you correlate that against the Nobel Prize, the number of Nobel Prize winners, Switzerland is on top of that uh, correlation, you get a correlation of 0.9 or something. Okay, is there a causality? Probably not. I still like chocolate, you never know, but uh, so, and you are in Switzerland, so you should not live without some chocolate. So, okay. So we observe correlations that are kind of surprising. So, and uh, if you see that, you say, oh, you know, electrostatic, that's the on rate. You change the properties of the surface, the, the complex is going to assemble more faster. I hope you know that binding affinity is the ratio of the on and off rate. So how fast does the complex form and how fast or how slow does the complex dissociate? So if it was the on rate, you would ex expect to observe those correlations with the on rate, but this is the on rate, no correlation, and this is the off rate, a much stronger correlation. So that's strange also. So uh, I don't want to spend too much time uh, going over all the details, uh, but we analyzed uh, all of that, and there is an explanation uh, actually for, for, for the different effects. So first of all, if there is a causality to it, the properties of the surface should be conserved along evolution. If you look at different complexes, uh, in evolution. And this is what we looked at. So we have a subset of 44 complexes that are non-redundant complexes. So there is no uh, sequence similarity between those. And you see, the, you see polar and charge, blue and red, and these vary greatly. Now, if you take one complex and then you go look along evolutions for homologous complexes, this is the percentage of sequence identity. You see this is much more conserved. And you can measure what is the average and standard deviation of those values. And if you do that over the entire set, you can do it by building a homology model, but you can also do it simply from sequence. And you see that uh, the standard deviations for the non-homologous complexes, those guys, is always much larger than the for homologous one. And we went down to about 30% sequence identity. So there seems to be something in evolutions that says that the surfaces of those proteins have been conserved to some extent. And these are global properties. Um, 
So then we had some explanation about uh, the different uh, reason why polar. Uh, again, I don't want to spend too much time now, but polarity is linked to the solvent shell. So they are, for example, uh, antifreeze proteins that have a high percentage of serine and threonine on their surface. And this is affecting the network of hydrogen bonds with water, preventing water to freeze, actually. So by increasing the polarity of the surface, you are stabiliz stabilizing the water shell around your complex. And this is protecting the complex from you know, bumping into other molecules, which you need energy to lead to dissociation. So, and this energy has to come from somewhere in solution. So if you stabilize the water shell of your complex, you are protecting it from interactions that might give you the energy needed to dissociate. Okay? And the charge effect is a long, the interface of your complex is basically sensitive to what's happening on the surface, to the charge. And you can demonstrate that using a simple electrostatic model. So using all of that, we basically uh, came up with a model of binding affinity for predicting, where we say, of course, the interface is still important. Okay? So that's the primary uh, kind of feature which is important to predict affinities, but you also have to consider the properties of the surface of your complex. So we came, so this is the classical interface model from uh, Horton and Lewis, which uh, discriminate between polar and apolar surface area at the interface. And we came with a model which still has the interface, but now we also calculate properties of the surface. So this is the number of atoms at the interface. This is a proxy of the buried surface area. And then we have the percentage of charge residue on the non-interacting surface and the percentage of polar residue on the non-interacting surface. So this is our model. And this is what it's giving. So Horton and Lewis gives you 0.5, the best energetic model that we tested. And these are not free energy calculation was giving you 0.5 as well. So now we are 0.64, so it's slightly better. And this was as good as it was getting at the time. And you also start seeing correlations for the complexes that are changing conformations uh, during binding. Uh, so this is all a model. So is there experimental evidence that actually this is happening? So we went to look into database of uh, mutations where people have been measuring changes in binding affinity upon mutation. And we classify the mutations as function of their distance from the interface. Okay, so if there is a contribution of this non-interacting surface to the binding, you should see mutation on the surface that are away from the interface and still causing changes in binding affinities. And this is what you are seeing here. So this is you are at the interface. So here you have huge changes. But as you move away, so this will be five angstrom from the interface. You see you go up to about four kcal per mole, but you can go up to about 12 angstrom and you still see mutations that might go up to 1.52 kcal per mole. So there are data out there that are indicating that this uh, model is not so crazy. Uh, and then, just a few slides and then I stop. Uh, we revisited this and we came with another model which was even simpler in a sense. Uh, this is the work of Anna van Gorne in a group where we basically have been looking at the number of contact at the interface. So we're just counting the number of residue, residue contact at the interface, classify those as polar, 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 apolar. So we have different types of contact. Train a model, basically. And uh, let me see. OK, so this is the final model. So the final model contains the contact at the interface, but it also contains the non-interacting surface. So the polar, and up, uh, the polar and charge residues. And the model now gets a correlation of 0.73. Uh, we had 0.64 with our non-interacting surface slash BSA model. So we have improved this a bit. And if you compare this model with all the other functions that were available at the time out there, uh, so you see here uh, Defire, Rosetta is there, PyDoc, so different models. So this is this contact-based non-interacting surface model. So we're getting correlations around 0.73. And the good thing of the model that it's also very robust for the flexible complexes. While all the other models have a hard time to predict the flexible complexes where there are conformational changes, this model seems to, to capture that quite well. 
Since, uh, so this was published in 2015. Since then, there have been other works that confirmed also the non-interacting surface independently. And there have been slightly improved models, but I think 0.75 is probably the best that you can get today with this kind of fast approaches. The advantage of this one, it's extremely fast. You just need to, contact, to, to calculate contacts. And that's one of the server that we are providing, Prodigy, where you basically upload a PDB file and it's going to give you the predicted affinity. Okay, with that, we go back here. And in sake of time, we should conclude. So hopefully I have convinced you that using data when you have them, and there might be much more data that you think which is valuable to model complexes, is uh, very useful to generate models. Uh, what we are doing in all the modeling uh, that we are doing, we're generating models. You should also realize that everything which is in a PDB, even all the crystal structure, they are all models. There is no single structure of a protein in a PDB which is not a model. Some of them are more models than others. But even in crystallography at high resolution, the bond length are defined by the model. The angles are defined by the model. So there is always a bit of modeling going in any experimental crystal structure. And NMR structure and cryo-EM structure. So everything is a model. Some are more model than others. So the models are not going to be fully accurate, but they are valuable to generate hypotheses. And with these hypotheses, you can go back to the lab, do experiment, and test the model. Uh, so in that respect, information-driven docking is very complementary to classical structural methods. So I need to thank the people who have been uh, involved in the work over the years. So this is a picture of the group uh, last year. Um, uh, also want to acknowledge funding from different European projects over the years to support our efforts with uh, BioXL in particular and the European Open Science Cloud being an ongoing project and also the Dutch Research Council of PUNT. And with that, oh, these are the ad hoc developers over the year, some networking events, everything about the interactions. Uh, if you are an experimentalist uh, and you are uh, generating structure of complexes, please contribute to the Capri experiments. We are always looking for new targets. Uh, so we depend on experimental people. So if some of you are doing that, then consider that. Another point, uh, when you do modeling, you cannot deposit, uh, deposit those models typically in databases. That's another limitation or problem. So you, have to, you want to share the data. I think if you publish papers about models, you should make your data available so that other people can use your models. So now if you are doing integrative modeling, so you have been using some kind of data to generate a model, the PDB has been working to build a repository of such models. Uh, it's called PDB Dev. At some point in the future, it's going to be absorbed by the standard PDB repositories but you cannot deposit those integrative models that are coming from a combination of techniques. Uh, we deposited one set when we have been doing some cryo-EM modeling there. Uh, so again, if you are generating models based on some data, there is a way of sharing that with other people now and depositing them. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Alexander, very much for your extensive and clear presentation. So we have a few time for questions. Hello, thanks for the talk. I have a question uh, about uh, the scoring uh, procedure in the ad hoc protocol. There is uh, the scoring at each step of the protocol, at the end of one of each step. Yes, yeah, so, so we have three different stages, and the first one is the rigid docking stage. So we have a different scoring function at that stage than at the final stage. The final stage, the interface are optimized because we allow for flexibility. So in, the, in a rigid body docking stage, we use the buried surface area, for example, in the scoring function. So the amount of surface and the van der Waals interactions are scaled down because they are not going to be very good anyway. So we use uh, buried surface area instead of the van der Waals as a weight. And the weights are also changed because uh, we also, th the treatment of electrostatic interactions is also different at different stages. So the default protocol will be that we use, um, we scale down the electrostatic by a factor 10 during our calculations when we are in the first and second stage. And when we go to water, we have the full electrostatic again. 
and this also affects the weight <coughs> that you are using. So each stage has different weight, but the most important one are the rigid body one, uh, because there we do a first selection, and you don't want to lose model in that selection, and then everything that goes from that uh, first selection, everything goes all the way to the end. So the final weight is the, uh, the relevant one. So if you use the server, what you are being presented are the final weights of the water refinement stage. Okay, thank you. Any other question? And you still have a chance to ask questions this afternoon, of course. Okay. I have a, a question about the scoring function again. So have you considered to uh, make a, a scoring function that works uh, only with a certain kind of protein-protein uh, interaction, for instance, uh, antibody-antigen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so we have not been following this approach. I know that some software are doing that. Um, First of all, you, will, you need enough data. Uh, so in the benchmark that we are using, we have about, you know, the current docking benchmark, which you use in the field, has about 230 complexes. And maybe, I don't know, 40 or 50, of, or probably 40 of those might be antibody antigen. So it's a small set, but you could optimize for that. Um, we decided not to do uh, for several reasons, because we are, so we have multi-body also docking ability. So you might be docking a system where you have a protein-protein interface binding to a DNA. So then there are different types of interfaces. And if you're going to have scoring functions which are interface specific, that makes everything very complicated. So we like the fact that we have a rather simple function, but you score peptides in the same way that you score nucleic acids and protein-protein interface. The only thing that we started changing now is for small molecule docking, where we, we have a, a different set of parameters uh, that we recommend for that. Uh, so you could do it, but we, we choose not to. Again, we, over the years we have been optimizing and some people, they wanted to revisit protein peptide or protein nucleic acid, and at the end they were still converging to numbers that were very close to the numbers that we use now. So again, if it's 0.9, then make it one, and it looks much nicer on paper. Okay, and the accuracy is not that high anyway. Thank you. Any other question? Thank you, first of all. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but just won't make you one because of the time. They are tired, the lunch time. And so I would like to stay on the scoring function mm -hmm. because one of my questions was on scoring function. About your combination, the intermezzo. So the combination between cosgrain and uh, yes. adocrio. Uh, we know that Mart we also use Martini, it's enthalpically driven. So how do you deal with this enthalpy uh, I would say, uh, overestimation in the scoring function or, or in finding the dimers? So I, I'm not sure if there's that much overestimation of enthalpy in Martini, at least in what we are doing. So there's one thing. So Martini has very few electrostatics, okay? So we are losing on the electrostatic, and maybe you are winning on the Van der Waals somewhere. Uh, so so it's, it's not clear. I think the other point to make, and when you, at the end, we score all atoms. So when uh, the, the, the end of a protocol is just morphing back the coarse grain model to all atoms, so then we are using the same scoring function. In the rigid body phase, we have not been re-optimizing our scoring function. Maybe we should, but we have not yet done that. Uh, I think another important point when you think of ad hoc is since we typically use data to drive the docking, the scoring function maybe becomes a bit less uh, critical in a sense. If you don't have data, then you are in trouble because we, we, we see that our sampling maybe is good, but we are losing them in our scoring. So we need to probably revisit scoring at the Martini level. Uh, but again, the data are saving us in, in, in many cases. Thank you. Uh, last one is practical one. You present about the PDB dev database is very nice with something similar with the Pluben Nest recently with the enhanced sampling simulations. How do you access the quality of the data? Because the point is that we, you can deposit a new structure, but how can we, uh, the user can be, no? Can yes. be assured that's that's that the, the, the yeah. quality, yeah. 
for to also in the view that you said it will be merged in the future in the PDP. Yeah. So how you, yeah. my question is. Uh, so that's an active uh, field of research. So there's a task force of the PDB. There's an integrative modeling task force of PDB. Uh, I'm a member of that one. So we had two meetings so far. And one of the, so the goal of the meetings is to define metrics to assess those models. Because now in the database, there is no metric. Okay, now you can deposit things. Uh, there have been recommendations published also. Uh, Andre Sally is very instrumental in this work. Uh, there's another uh, kind of white paper which has been submitted to structures. So this should appear probably in the next months where there are recommendations about what to assess. But there is no validation part yet in the deposition system. You would expect that the data, the model should fulfill the, the basic chemistry. So basically, you know, chemistry, stereochemistry, but that's easy to fool when you do modeling. Uh, they should explain the data, but it's not yet clear what should be the criteria. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes uh, and I think also the, the idea here in this integrative model, you should be able to, to submit multiple solutions. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, in the new version of the portal, we, we want to facilitate the position. So we are actually working toward generating MMC format for integrative models. And ideally, we would like to put in that all the cluster that you get with the different scores, mm -hmm. because this is what your model gives you, and not just pick one model. Uh, but then that's also, that, that will be the future. But that's, yeah. uh, that's work in progress uh, at yeah. the worldwide level, I'd say. No, but I believe this is the direction where to go also yeah. in terms of our community or enhanced yeah. sampling, do the, the same. Uh, but you know, in the past also, Andre Shali, I'm very glad yeah. to hear from you, because the model base was on the first example of kind of database to mm -hmm. To, to put uh, uh, model structure, but the reliability of those structures depends on the yeah. by the user. So this is yeah. a critical point that yeah. we should also for us, for, for the plumen nest yeah. as well. Uh, it's yeah. a critical point if you want to be you know, uh, believed by the experimentalists yeah. or the yeah. uh, people. Again, I think so, so the model should make sense in terms of stereochemical. The same validation that are applied to crystal structure are going probably to be applied to those models, depending on resolution, because if you have a coarse grain model, then you cannot apply the same. But it's not because you fulfill those data, those, those uh, requirements that your model is correct. So the, 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 the assessment of the data that went in is an important part, but that's not going to be simple because we also need some unified format so that you can develop tools that are going to assess. So that's, on, there's on a long way to go. On the other end, we may say the same for the experimental structure because yeah. the different groups may have different structures depending on the experimental conditions. So there are variables, yeah. The, yeah. but the most things to check that the things are done at the state of the art. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree. Yeah. Thank you. So I have a technical curiosity about probably mainly protein peptide interaction. So mm -hmm. how do does Haddock deal with no standard residue? Have you special libraries or oh, Haddock deals with uh, non standard residues? Non standard so yeah. residues. So we have uh, we have support for a number of non standard residues. I'm going to, I can show that in, in the afternoon. So there's a link where you can find what is supported. So we have phosphorylated, acetylated, methylated, a number of those, sulfonated. Uh, we didn't systematically add those, but we added them to the library when we needed them or when a user was asking for it. But there's already quite an extended list of modified amino acids that are supported. When people ask for new ones, it depends very much how easy it is to, uh, to add them. Okay. But they, they are there. And then you will have a, actually we'll see in the tutorial an example of a phosphorylated histidine and how you have to give it to the, to the portal. Great. So? Tired. Okay. Tired, <laughs> hungry. Thank you. So thank okay. you again. Thank you. Alexander. <laughs> so let's go for lunch and we will be back at uh, room 156.